Uh, the program this evening um, is dedicated by uh, Andrea Stern and Isaac Singer for the 25th yard site of Andrea's father, Aaron Ben Yitzchak Zichrona Levracha, uh, the yard site being this week, 26th of, uh, of Kashman. Um, please make sure, sorry, please make sure that, uh, that you have, not only that you have the source sheets, but also that you signed in at the table. You cannot get credit without that. Um, emailing me afterwards and saying I was there does not help. So, uh, so please make sure that you, uh, that you sign in, and please make sure that your email address is legible because we send out the letters uh, via email. Okay, um, if you have a cell phone but for some reason uh, and you could, uh, you could silence it or put it on vibrate, that would be helpful. And last, the, uh, the topic that we're dealing with this evening, this issue of um, you know, Jewish litigants in civil court, is regrettably a, uh, a topic with many practical ramifications. I'm going to be discussing both the, uh, the Jewish law as well as the law society's rules and, uh, and secular law where relevant. Um, but please, if you're dealing with a practical question of Jewish law, consult your Jose, consult your halachic authority, your shul rabbi, someone other than me. Headaches go elsewhere. Um, this is accredited for one and a half professionalism credits. Um, the uh, the criteria is right there on the first spot on the uh, on the sheet. Recognizing and being sensitive to client circumstances, special needs, and intellectual capacity, e.g., multicultural, language, gender, social, socioeconomic status, demeanor. So here specifically, what we're talking about is where you have a, uh, a Jewish client, and the Jewish client uh, has a case and wants to go to secular court. And the question is, how will Jewish law view this? And what are the options? And I give you four cases here uh, on, the, uh, on the sheet. First one, Sarah, an observant Jew, wishes to file suit against her neighbor David for damage caused by his dog to her lawn. David is Jewish as well. Sarah files suit in Beit Din. She wants to go to a Beit Din, Beit Din being a Jewish court of law. David refuses to go to Beit Din. What are Sarah's options in Jewish law? She's trying to do what she believes is her religious duty. She's going to, uh, she's going to go to a Beit Din, to a Jewish court. The other litigant is not interested. Now what can she do? And that's going to be our first question. Our second one, Miriam, an observant Jew, invested in a business run by Timothy, who is not Jewish. Alleging fraud, Miriam wishes to sue Timothy. Is Miriam obligated to sue Timothy in a Beit Din? Right? One Jew one non-Jew in the case, is she required to try to get Timothy to agree to go to a rabbinical court? That's the second, uh, that's our second question. Our third one, Jill and Jane, both observant Jews, have been business partners for many years. They now have a dispute regarding the terms of their profit-sharing agreement. They would like to go to a non-Jewish arbitrator who will operate neither by Jewish law nor by Ontario law. May they do so. Okay, that will be the, uh, the third case. And then the last one, Jonathan, an observant Jew, is a tenant of an observant Jewish landlord, Chaya. Jonathan believes that Chaya has failed to fulfill her duties as a landlord, such as by failing to provide adequate heat in the winter. May Jonathan take the case to the Ontario Landlord and Tenant Board? All of these are questions because, as we're going to see, Judaism has a decided bias and, in fact, a law against resorting to secular courts. And so the question is going to be, what happens in all, of these, uh, in all of these cases? Now, there are two different ways we could look at these questions. One way to look at the question is, how can I help an observant Jewish client who wishes to obey Jewish law and wishes to go to secular court? What are the options? That's what we're going to discuss tonight. The other half of this is the question of, let's say I am an observant Jewish lawyer. I am observant and Jewish, I am not a lawyer, but let's pretend. I am an observant Jewish lawyer, and I have a Jewish client who doesn't care about the Jewish law aspects of this, and just wants to go to, uh, to secular court. I have a problem myself. What am I supposed to do? That's not for tonight, that's going to be the class in December. Our next session in December, I think it's Sunday morning, December 10th, uh, in Thornhill. If you're on the email list, if you signed in, you'll get notification of it.
But um, there we're going to discuss the problem of the lawyer who is personally observant of Jewish law and is being asked to do something that seems to conflict with Jewish law. So that'll be, that's the December one, that's not tonight. Our case tonight comes under Rule 3.1-2, sort of, in in, uh, source number two. If you take a look at my quote from the Rules of Professional Conduct, a lawyer shall perform any legal services undertaken on a client's behalf to the standard of a competent lawyer. Okay? Any legal services that you're asked to perform, you perform to the standard of a competent lawyer. Now that says legal services. But the commentary to it, commentary 10, notes, in addition to opinions on legal questions, the lawyer may be asked for or may be expected to give advice on non-legal matters such as the business, economic, policy, or social complications involved in the question of the course the client should choose. Dot, dot, dot. And so the, uh, the question here is, what sort of non-legal advice is the lawyer able to give to the client for how the case may be, may be pursued while following the, uh, the, the terms of Jewish law? Are we, are we clear in terms of what we're, where we're going or what we're, what we're trying to accomplish? The question is, I have an observant Jewish client who wants to go to civil court for whatever reason, or wanted to go to a bait din and can't because of the nature of the litigants involved. And the, uh, the question is, how can you advise such a client to, to proceed? So in order to deal with this, we need to first understand why Jewish law has a rule about going to Jewish courts in particular. Why is there, and not just a preference, but a, uh, a, a requirement, in fact, to go to rabbinical court instead of going to secular court? What would you say? Sorry? The reason behind it originally, right now there's no reason to go to the start of the rabbinical court at all. Okay. Originally, in the 18th, 17th, 16th century, the way it was done, it was basically the judgment courts were totally biased against Jews. There's no question. Therefore, if a Jew went to court, he'd be punished, he'd be put in jail, he might be killed. So they basically it's a completely different situation. So that's an interesting that's an interesting suggestion, right? That suggest the suggestion that was made, since not everybody can probably hear over the uh, the sound of the ventilation system. The uh, if you're gonna speak if you can speak up that will that will be good. But the, the argument is that the courts historically were biased against Jews, and therefore there was a requirement of proceeding in Jewish courts specifically. It's an interesting suggestion, but the sources that we see in Jewish law going way, way back don't actually make mention that as a consideration. They, uh, that doesn't seem to be their, their, concern, uh, their concern at all. So what would be the reason? Yeah? Wouldn't the reason be because we're supposed to be covered by Jewish law? And if you believe in the Torah, you believe in what Shad has to say, then presumably you would want to be exact for law. So the argument would be, since you're Jewish, you're supposed to follow Jewish law, so go to a rabbinical court that's going to decide cases based on Jewish law. That would be another argument. The weakness in that, though, is that we have a basic principle that when there are two parties engaged in some kind of a transaction, some kind of a contract, they're able to agree to whatever they want between them, and as as long as they don't directly violate a rule within Jewish law, they can follow whatever rules they choose. So, for example, we have a prohibition against lending money and charging interest. Two parties are not allowed to come up with a deal with each other in which the interest will be charged. We won't accept that. However, they're allowed to make whatever terms they want within their arrangement, as long as they are not flying directly against Jewish law. So why couldn't they decide? We've, de- we've decided for ourselves. We want to arbitrate, or we want, we want our case to be heard in a secular jurisdiction rather than in, uh, rather than in a Jewish one. Yeah. You were going to say? I was going to answer you. Right. Same idea. Same idea. Dr. Nussbaum. Oh, no, no, no. If you're looking at the source sheet, that's cheating. That's my answers. You can't take my answers. Okay, so we'll get to number six. To prevent, Michael says to prevent Chil Hashem, to prevent desecration of God's name, meaning if we keep it among ourselves, they won't find out. That doesn't work, you know, right? <laughs> that doesn't really work, certainly in this day and age. The, uh, but the idea of keep your problems among yourselves. Okay. What do you got? You're insulting the Torah. 
by going to secular law. You're saying secular law is better than the Jewish. Right. So maybe there's a concern that you're declaring their system is better than our system. Our system is not fair enough. Our system is not good enough. Is not sophisticated enough. I need to go elsewhere. That's a potential argument as well. I think in order to address this, though, we really need to go back to the basics of systems of law and judicial systems altogether. Because that's evolved in terms of why we have a judicial system, what the nature is of the judicial system. Historically, the goal of a judicial system was justice, but justice was considered to be a function of the government. And failure to accept the court or failure to accept the local system of law was considered an act of treason against the throne. If I didn't accept whatever the local king or, uh, or whatever authority it was, whatever he said, this is your system of rules, if I said I want to go by my own rules, that was considered to be rebellion against the local authority. I brought you source number three from one work, the Civil Law Tradition, an introduction to the legal systems of Europe and Latin America. And they talk about Justinian's code of law. The corpus juris civilis of Justinian was not restricted to Roman civil law. It included much that had to do with the power of the emperor, the organization of the empire, and a variety of other matters that lawyers today would classify as public law. It was meant to handle the affairs of the empire, and it tied into the authority of the emperor. uh, If you move forward in history to the Abbasids, in source number four, judicial authority and Cadiz autonomy under the Abbasids, Cadiz would come to be known as, as religious judges. But take a look at this, number four. As Joseph Schacht argued in the 1950s, the office of Qadi began in the Umayyad period as that of a legal secretary to provincial governors. Documentary evidence from Egypt confirms that governors were indeed regarded as being the highest judicial authority in early Islam and that their legal powers far surpassed that of any other judge. The governor had the power. In large cities, governors appointed and dismissed Cadiz at their will. Decisions taken by Cadiz could be swiftly overruled by political authorities. Although the Abbasids reformed and centralized the judiciary in the second half of the 8th century, Cadiz were still subordinate to reigning rulers and unable to impose judgments that displeased the caliph or his main representatives. So that... The the governor was the one who really had the authority. The governor was the one behind the law. And it wasn't really about an independent judiciary at all. It was a function of the government. Last source on the Aztecs, similar point. I'm not going to read it aloud. You can see it there. I think think the point is made that law, generally speaking, reflected the ideals, including religious ideals, of the empire, If the empire is displeased with the judgment, the judgment is overridden, and a minority within this society which said, you know what, we don't subscribe to the local religion, or we don't believe in the local authority, did not have any options for judicial autonomy. The government, with its power, was the one that said, this is your system of law, and that's all you have. Now, the Western world of today has largely moved away from this model. So a model where the key is simply swift justice, or an attempt at swift justice anyway, for, uh, for all citizens. That's why we have the option of accepting you know, outside systems for adjudicating cases, whether that's methods of arbitration that use different sets of rules, whether it's the, uh, the establishment of tribunals for specific areas of law. uh, Even religious law may be used for arbitration in certain areas of law, famously not in all areas of law, but uh, but, but today government is more willing to accept the idea of an outside system of law. So you have these two different models. You have the first model, which is law is, in fact, established by and, and, and part of the authority of the government. And then today's model of the independent judiciary, which isn't directly tied to the government. When you look at the Jewish judicial system, it's much closer to the historical system. The goal of the judicial system in Jewish law is about the ideals of the religion and respect for God. That's the, way that it's, uh, that's the way that it's viewed, and that's what drives the prohibition. 
against going to a secular court. It's considered, somebody said before, an insult to God to go elsewhere. If you take a look on your sheet, if you flip to source number six, passage out of the Talmud. So we're now going back to a period roughly 2,000 years ago. They're going to quote Rabbi Tarfon. So it's, uh, it's roughly first century common era. In general, for all of these sources, in the interest of time, I'm going to be reading the English aloud. I brought the Hebrew because I think it's important to have it there, especially for Hebrew readers. But my Tarphone would say, wherever you find the courts of idolaters, he uses the term idolaters, that's what's found in the, uh, in the Talmud, but it doesn't mean people who literally worship statues. It means people who are not Jewish in general. The Hebrew phrase is technically ovdei kochavim, which means worshippers of stars. Anyone know why he would use that term if it means people who are not Jewish in general? Why does it say worshippers of stars? It's not that all human beings were either Jews or star worshippers. That's not it. Mm. Why is it using that term? In those days, that's what they did. Mm. Before Christianity, this land Right. However, the text itself is that we're working with is a text that was indeed in use through the years of Christianity and the Index and banned books. Generally speaking, the, um, the Jews who had books, and particularly the Talmud, that said anything that might be interpreted in a negative way regarding Christianity would find their books confiscated, burned, pages torn out, pages pasted together, and so on. And so the easiest way to avoid this was to say, well, we're not talking about you, we're talking about star worshippers, the Ovdei uh, Kochavim. So that if the church got upset and said, how in the world could you say that, uh, that you don't like our, our code of law? We said, oh no, your code of law is great. Your, your courts are just fine. We meant star worshippers. So, um, so Rabbi Tarifun would say, wherever you find the courts of idolaters, you may not resort to them, even should their decisions match those of Israel. Even if their rules are the same as our rules. No concern for bias, no concern for an inappropriate ruling, it doesn't matter. And he quotes a verse from Shemot, from Exodus. It is written, the Torah states, These are the judgments you shall place before them, before the population of Jews, before them, and not before idolaters. You're supposed to go to a Jewish court. That's the passage there in the Talmud. It does not explain why. But now let's talk through the, uh, the, the reasons. If you see source number seven, Rabbi Moses Maimonides, also known as Rambam, he makes the argument that it's about degrading Jewish law. He says, one who litigates before idolatrous judges and in their courts is wicked, even should their decisions match those of Israel. It is as though he had blasphemed and raised a hand against the Torah of Moshe, of Moses, our master, where the hand of idolaters is stronger and one's opponent is powerful, such that he can't claim from the opponent in Jewish courts, then he should claim from him before Jewish judges first. Should he refuse to come, one could then seek permission from the Beit Din and rescue his property from the opponent and the laws of the idolaters. That's the second half, which we have to get to later. So according to Maimonides, what's the concern involved in litigating in a secular court? What is it that bothers him? Right, it's degrading. It looks like... I am rejecting my heritage and, uh, and giving it, uh, and instead going over to, uh, to, to the secular system. And that's the position taken in the Shulchan Aruch, in the, uh, in, in the Code of Jewish Law. And that's the idea. And if you take a look at source number eight, this is something I mentioned before. Rabbi Moses Nachmanides, Ramban, says shortly after the, uh, that period in, uh, of Maimonides, he says, should the two litigants want to come before a regular Jew, this would be permitted. Where they accept him, his verdict stands. It doesn't have to be a judge. You can decide, two Jewish litigants can say, we want to go to a certain Jew who's going to be our, uh, our judge. However, they may never come before idolaters to judge according to their laws. So that's our starting point here within Jewish law. Things at this point look pretty bleak, right? 
Like, what am I going to do? My, uh, you just told me that Maimonides, the Code of Jewish Law, uh, they're, they're against going to secular courts, so am I out of business? Is that, uh, is that the end? So the answer is clearly it's not the end, because, you know, we're getting an hour and a half worth of credits here, so it can't be that we're going to spend the next, uh, you know, hour and, uh, and 11 minutes twiddling our thumbs. So, so the question is, what happens? And in order, to, in order to deal with it, we need to go a little further in terms of understanding Understanding this because there's a fundamental problem with what we've just read. There's a fundamental problem with sources 6, 7, and 8, which tell me that you're not supposed to go to a secular court, that you're not supposed to work with their system that is considered degrading to our system. And the problem is source number 9. Source number 9 is a statement by the sage Shmuel in which he says... In the Hebrew, it goes, or in the Aramaic, it goes, Dina de Mahusa Dina, the law of the kingdom is the law. In other words, I as a Jew have an obligation, recognized by Jewish law, to follow the law established by the government. If the government tells me that I have to file my taxes, if the government tells me I am not allowed to park my car over there, if the government tells me that this area is zoned for one use and not for another use, I'm not entitled to do my own thing. I am required to follow the law as established by the, uh, by the government. And the, uh, sorry? Civil Civil authority, that's correct. That's my, that's my religious duty. Um, and there are various reasons given for that. Yeah? Correct, correct. There are certain stipulations. The law of the land has to be a fair law, evenly applied to everybody. That is true. The law of the land also is not to be followed if it directly contravenes the law of Torah. Meaning, if the law of the land is everybody has to eat a cheeseburger on Tuesdays, then no, I'm not going to follow the law of the land. I have a, uh, I have a prior commitment. The, um, this is true. However, my fundamental problem is going to be, if I have to respect the law of the land, why can't I use their courts? Isn't that basic respect? Read. Well, I think on the, on the practical aspect, the practical implementation is that every Jewish courts are, in this day and time, are not equipped to handle the cases. You may report the case, they will have no tenth for the week. The laws and the rules that they made for this province to run house under, it's not a Jewish court that would be in a position to adjudicate that. Why not? Why not? Why not? They have to master that type of law. Yeah. Or silly. Hey, I mean, I know if it's silly or not silly. I think it's pretty important. The, um, but, uh, but it really raises an interesting question. It's a little bit tangential at this point, but we're going to have to deal with this at some point. The, um, Reed notes that the, the case at hand may involve some kind of um, more, either more complicated area or more specialized area of information. If you're going to go to a religious court, it's going to, they're going to have to actually train. They're going to have to know what the issues are. I, I had the opportunity to interact with the Bethany of America, under the Rabbinical Council of America on numerous occasions, and they regularly have judges on their cases who are lawyers, who are accountants, who are specialists in particular fields, in order to address the issues that may come up with specialized areas. So, so yes, that, that is going to be a factor, but my fundamental question is, if we respect the law of the land such that we say we are obligated to follow it, then... Adam, I'm missing something. Why is it that we that that we aren't able to to use their courts? It's a, it's a strange thing. So, this is the law we apply in civil law as it applies to society. Yeah. Whereas, you know, with the best of today, we don't have the Jewish authority, not the real Jewish authority, here in the West Coast. So, between one Jew and another Jew, there's a sort of dispute. <coughs> there, they may have to go to the best of. But this is the, all the other laws that apply, whether it's speaking that you may not have to pay for taxes, or you can park wherever you want, or if you want to borrow parking, you can park, or all of those things. Dina de Vapositina apply, you can't do that. Right, so Michael suggests that maybe this idea that the law of the land is the law doesn't extend to interactions between two private citizens. The, uh, but actually, we, we generally assume it does. So uh, that won't help me, yeah. Family law, 
basically that's why you have something called Sharia law. But the, the, the best principles are completely different than the civil law. But yet, we have to follow civil law. We have to follow the American civil law. Regardless, it's got, in many areas, it's the opposite of what Jewish law is. And that's why you have Sharia law. Basically, it doesn't allow the Palestinians to even have any access to rule right. anything for them. Right. So, basically, what I'm saying is that you have no choice. In, in some situations, you want to follow Jewish law. That's a, right. And we're going to come back to that towards the end. But, but in terms of this question, I think there are three answers to this question. To the question of, if you honor and respect the law of the land, why won't you go to their courts? The first answer goes back to what we already said from Maimonides before. And this is the issue of the honor of God. If you take a look at source number 10, the comment by Rashi, Rabbi Shlomo Yitzhaki, writing in the 11th century in France, he says, you don't bring your case before their courts. For one who brings Jewish litigation before non-Jews desecrates the name, meaning the name of God, and honors idolatry, treating it as important. Now, it sounds like what he is saying here is that it's a matter of respect for Judaism, and if I go to an outside court that I don't respect Judaism, I accept their authority. I might have thought that he's only talking about where the other court has, is affiliated with some god or another. It's a Christian court, it's a Muslim court, it's a whatever it is, but he's not. He says this regarding secular courts as well. One concern is this, uh, this concern for divine honor. Then there's a second concern, which I find to be fascinating historically, because it really was borne out historically. And this is the concern voiced by Rabbi Shlomo Ibn Aderet in source number 11. This is more of a patriotic concern, so to speak. He said, his, he's, he's arguing with somebody who had said, if I believe the law of the land is the law, then I should be able to go to the secular courts. Exactly the argument that I wanted to make. And his response is, take a look at number 11, please. To deduce from this, meaning from the principle of obeying government legislation, to follow the ways of the nations and their laws, he says, God forbid that this holy nation act thus, all the more so if they will now increase their sin, uprooting the portion of a father upon his children, depending upon this fragile reed. He was dealing with, a, with an inheritance case in which they wish to follow the secular laws of inheritance instead of the Jewish laws of inheritance. He says, how could you do that? One who does this tears down the walls of the Torah and uproots root and branch, and the Torah will demand recompense from his hand. One who increases his wealth thus will stumble in his own deeds. And I say that any who rely on saying that this is permitted because we must obey the law of the land is mistaken and a thief. And here he gets to the most important part. In number 11, after the ellipsis, he says, Such a person uproots all of the laws of the complete Torah. Why would we need the sacred texts which Rebbe, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, and then Ravina and Ravashi composed for us? Let them teach their children the laws of the nations and build for them patchwork altars in the madrasas of the nations. That's a play on words of the biblical verse. But, the, um, but he, says, why, he, says, he says, in that case, why bother learning Torah at all? He says, God forbid, let there not be such in Israel and so on. What is his concern? As opposed to the concerns we've voiced so far, what is Rabbi Shlomo Ibn Aderet, Rashba, what is he worried about? Continuity, assimilation. Continuity, assimilation, yeah? Uh, practical application of Torah. Practical application of Torah, yeah? Alienation from Judaism. Alienation from Judaism. All true. All of these answers, I think, are accurate. We're going to come back to this point, because what he said came true. Yeah? Right, well, the issue of him go, uh, someone going to secular court in order to get a ruling that they like, um, I, don't, I don't know if I see that in his words. I, it's a general concern, and it will, that can work both ways, you know. The, uh, but, but his concern here, the concern that he's voicing here is, then you won't need a Torah anymore. And I want to show you what happened with his point, because it's fascinating to see. So we're going to have to come back to that. But that's the second concern. The first concern is honor of God. 
Second concern is, you're going to destroy our laws, you're going to destroy our Torah. And then the third concern is, to me, a beautiful concern. It's a religious concern, as really all of these are, but in a particularly interesting way. I've heard any number of times high-ranking judges talk about how their Jewish heritage influenced their decision to go into law. Right? You've heard this, I assume, in interviews as well, where they talk about even people who have very little in terms of a Jewish heritage, but they'll say, Tzedek, Tzedek, Tirdof, they always learned as a child that Judaism believes that you shall pursue justice. It's considered a very strong um, Jewish value. But more than that, the execution of justice in Judaism is considered a religious responsibility, partnering with God to build up the world. Such that, if you take a look at source number 12, you have a passage in the Talmud, a judge who judges truthfully, even for a moment, is considered by scripture as a partner of God in creation. If you flip the page, source number 13... A judge who judges truthfully causes God to be manifest in Israel, as it is written, dot, dot, dot. And a judge who does not judge truthfully causes God to leave Israel, dot, dot, dot. The, um, what's the name of the religious high court that we historically had? What's it called? Sanhedrin. Correct, the Sanhedrin. Where did the Sanhedrin meet? Not just in Jerusalem, but in, inside, inside the Beit HaMikdash, inside the temple in Jerusalem. The holiest site is where the high court convened. <clears throat> that conveys a message. It conveys the message that to carry out justice is fundamentally a religious act. There's a very interesting juxtaposition found in the biblical text. Exodus chapter 20. It's famous for including what event? Anybody know? Shmot Chaf, Exodus 20. What event happens in that chapter? Yeah, the giving of the Torah at Sinai. Next chapter, Exodus chapter 21, presents a code of civil law. Here is your civil law. Side by side with God speaking to human beings and revealing the Torah is, and this is what you do if one person gives somebody else something to watch and then it gets stolen. The two are side by side to convey a message, which is the, the emphasis on justice from a religious perspective. Which is also why, when you open up the prophets in Tanakh, you find that consistently they voice two criticisms of the nation. One criticism of the Jews is they're following idols, and the other criticism is they're not practicing justice, or they're taking advantage of the vulnerable within society. Those two go hand in hand throughout Tanakh. It's looked at as a religious act. Well, the problem with that... Yeah, Jeffrey. How did you counter that by saying that Shabbat is opening up the obligation Just the opposite. That's the proof. No, That's the proof. Justice, justice part of civilization, part of, part of mankind. So, so Jeffrey points out that justice is not just for us, it's for everybody. In fact, there's one of these seven laws that are supposed to apply to all human beings is indeed to have a system of law. In fact, that is, according to some, why Jewish law recognizes the authority of the law of the land. Because how could you say that there's a mitzvah for them to set up laws and then disobey the laws that they set up? It would be hypocritical. But I don't think that takes away from the religious character of having law and having courts. I think that it points to the fact that Judaism believes in a religious world beyond Jews. The idea that there is a certain religious expectation for human beings as a whole. The same set of laws also says don't worship idols. So I think, uh, I think it's a religious expectation there as well. But what the, the problem with this, in other words, what we've just said is all very nice and all well and good to say that, the, that, there's an ob- that, that there is a religious obligation to practice justice. But what it also means is that if I practice justice by going outside of the religious system, then I have separated justice from religion. That's what I've done. Effectively, it's like deciding, instead of going to a mikvah, I'm going to take a bath. 
Right? That's what that's what I will have that's what I will have done, and that's the fundamental problem. So for these three reasons, there is a drive to go to a Beit Din, to go to a religious court. Number one, because going outside is considered an insult to God as the originator of this system of law. Number two, because it will stifle the Torah, and we're going to talk about this more in a moment. And number three, because justice is considered a religious responsibility. So the upshot of this, and this is, I think, the major point to come away with from this, is that it's not viewed, we don't view secular courts as biased, unjust, or unreasonable. That's not the reason for the objection. It's that the Jewish system of law, like the older systems of law that existed in general around the world, was considered to be about God. It was considered to be about the authority of the one who, who gave us these, uh, these laws. Which is why it's not about going to a Jewish judge. Let's say you're going to get a Jewish judge who will judge your case according to a secular system of law. Would that be okay under this? No, right? You won't, you won't be able to, uh, to accept that. Just the opposite. It could be argued that it's even worse. Take a look at source number 14. Rabbi Avram Yeshaya Karelis, also known as Chazanish, was asked this question about going to a Jewish judge in a secular system. And he said, even though they have no judge in a, he's dealing with a certain place, they have no judge to adjudicate via Torah law, and they need to appoint a wise person to follow human ethics, they may not accept the laws of the nations or to establish their own laws. One who, would judge, one who judges every case that comes before him as it appears to him is carrying out what is recognized as compromise. Yeah, I'm going to skip the rest of this. So we're not ready for, for the rest of it yet. But his point is that a Jewish judge using a secular system is just as unacceptable to him. It's not about the religion of the judge. It's about, it's about the legal system itself. That's the, that's the, the issue. Now I get to my footnote on the way this played out in, uh, in history. The concern of Rabbi Shlomo Ibn Adaret of what it would do to, uh, to Jewish law. Justice Menachem Elon was a judge on Israel's Supreme Court and a, a giant in terms of his knowledge of religious law and, uh, and secular law. He argued that the ability to handle our own cases when we lived in societies that gave Jews judicial autonomy was what kept our law alive and evolving. The section of Jewish law that deals with disputes between parties, called Chosh and Mishpat, that, was, that, kept, that, that remained alive, able to deal with cases, able to evolve as needed, only as long as we were able to handle cases. We, went, we ran into trouble due to two historical factors. There were periods when our courts lacked the ability to compel people to appear before them, and there were periods when the government insisted that we had to use their courts. And the result of this is that you find repeated problems in which Jewish leaders tried to steer people back to our courts and were, by degrees, successful or unsuccessful. If you take a look at your sheet, it's source number 15. A decree from the court of Rabbeinu Tam, 12th century Western Europe. They announced, We voted and decreed and excommunicated and banned any man or woman near or far who brings another to the laws of the nations, parentheses idolaters, or compels via the nations, parentheses idolaters. This is to satisfy the censor. Um, Whether noble or citizen, ruler or officer, other than with their mutual agreement and kosher witnesses, dot, dot, dot. Tell me something. Rabbeinu Tam's court needs to issue a decree banning and excommunicating anybody who goes to a secular court. Why did they need to issue such a decree? Because everyone was going to a secular secular court. You don't need to issue a decree like that if if no one's doing it. Right? They're dealing with a particular problem. Fast forward to the 16th century to Greece. Rabbi Benjamin ben Matityahu 
I, he observed people going to secular court and he said, I said that in such a, a place, silence is inappropriate. From what I saw and my ears heard of the band of wicked people, six people of the leaders of this work, aside from their descendants, who gathered and went to the municipal judge and produced a decree from him that no sage rabbi or appointee of Israel may judge Torah law. They had actually gone to the secular government and gotten a decree saying that there shall be no Jewish law practiced. And he goes on in that, uh, in, that, in that vein. You also find legal compromises that were meant to keep Jews out of secular, uh, out of secular court. One example of that from the second century common era is something that's known as Zabla. What is Zabla? Zebar Echad. What does it mean? Correct. Each party in a case where, where one person is suing another, each party in a case chooses a judge, and then the two judges choose a third judge to convene a court. That's not classically the way we did things. The way we did things was you had a bench. There were set judges on set courts. Second century common era we start doing this method of having them choose judges who would handle cases. Why? Because it was a way to get people to use the Jewish courts as opposed to going to the, uh, to the, the secular court. The rule was you could accept at that point anyone to judge, even people who had not had proper training. Fast forward from the 2nd century to the 13th century, take a look at source number 17. Rabbi Shlomo Ibn Adarit is asked about a city in which they don't have judges who are trained. And the question is, should they go to secular court? And he says, nope. Appoint a judge who doesn't know what he's doing. He says, take a look, source 17. He says, you asked. Tell me, when it says, quote, anyone who appoints an improper judge is as though he plants an asherah. An asherah was a, uh, a tree that was used in certain cult types of worship. What should we do in cities where there are none who know so much as one letter, and we need to appoint them to judge and arbitrate against the will of the litigant? If we don't appoint anyone, they're going to go to the courts of the non-Jews, and he says, yeah, you take the guy who doesn't know what he's doing. Better that than to go to the, uh, the secular court. You see that this was a battle for centuries and centuries, this issue of trying to get people to stick to the Jewish courts. And Justice Alone points out something fascinating. If you look at the Ashkenazi works, the responsa, the documents that show how cases were handled, the works of Jewish law over the centuries, and you compare them with the Sparti, works of law. Starting from the period of the emancipation in Europe, okay, end of the 18th century into the 19th century, when Jews are liberated within society, but as the price for that, we no longer have autonomy. We now have to go to the secular courts. That was the trade-off. Sure, you can have all the rights you want, you can go to university, you can do these things, but you're going to have to now be a part of society fully. What you find is... The Spartic works of law in Muslim lands have much more practical development in terms of the way they handle cases, in terms of dealing with up-and-coming issues. From that period forward, they have way more practical material and much more in terms of practical rulings than the Ashkenazi ones do. The Ashkenazi ones tend to have long discussions of theoretical issues that are found in the Talmud without practical application. The Sephardi ones tend to have practical applications. Why? Because the Sephardi are actually able to do it. They're actually able to issue rulings in those lands. The Ashkenazim in Europe are being told, you're not allowed to, to judge cases. They're not hearing practical issues. So Rashba was right about what the impact would be of Jews going to secular courts, the atrophy of the, uh, the Jewish legal system. So, okay. What we've now established... In other countries, the courts stopped Jewish courts? Not fully, but their caseload dropped intensely. Yeah. The, and it depends on the country also, because different countries had emancipation at different stages. It was, and some had it and then rolled it back and then had it again. Yeah. So I'm sure. um, yes. The Jewish law, and this is throughout the centuries, women were not allowed to testify. They didn't accept the women as a witness. For certain types of cases, right. yes, for most. Now, whatever. there is a major issue. You're yes. in, for example, Canada. Yeah. Or something else. You go and tell a civil court 
as a lawyer, that basically we're not allowing this woman to testify. Basically, the government... There's no such issue. You, why, why would Jewish law not allow a woman to testify in civil court? No, I'm talking about testifying before that's not... You, you, you're talking about bringing a religious court proceeding in front of a, uh, a civil court. Yeah. And the best thing is to accept this witness. Right. Of course, they'll go to the civil court. If this is their witness to prove their case, and right. the best thing is to accept this witness. No, they may feel their case will get a better hearing under the rules of a civil court. Right. I understand they'll that. They'll accept the witness. Right. The woman, Understood. Of course, they won't. So right. Basically, there are no, no that's good enough reasons why you didn't go to civil court. Not, not really. If not really, because I mean, for for most of your cases, this won't be germane. I'll tell you, we can discuss after why, but for most cases, what you're, what you're pointing out won't be germane, because the issue of women testifying on an action will be more relevant in criminal cases, which a bait in isn't happening anyway. No, but let me, uh, again, it's a, it's a tangent, so we can talk about it afterwards. The, um, but that's, that's all background. Everything that we've done for the last 40 minutes covers why there is such an opposition to it, but it also plants the seeds for what we now have to turn to, which is the question of, so what do you do in practice? Right? You have an observant Jewish client who wants to pursue litigation in a secular court. What are your options? So let's go back to case number one. Right, the first case we had. Sarah is the observant Jew who has a Jewish neighbor named David, and David, um, David's dog has damaged her lawn. Sarah says, I want to go to Beit Din. She has him subpoenaed, so to speak. It's called a hasmana. She has him summoned to the Beit Din. David says, I'm not interested. You want to deal with it? Meet me in secular court. We'll hear it in the uh, in in, uh, in small claims court, whatever it's going to be. What options does Sarah have at her disposal? So here we get to something called in in Aramaic heter erkaot. It means permission to go to the courts. Erkaot is the classic Talmudic term for courts that are not Jewish courts. Take a look, please, at source number eighteen. Source number 18 is written by Rabbeinu Asher, but he's quoting an idea that's much older than his... It goes back long before his time. He's quoting a source here, Rav Paltiel Gaon, who I believe is 9th century common era, dealing with this question. There was no dog, there was no lawn, but the question of how a Jew would end up going to a secular court. He quotes you a passage from the Talmud which states... What is the source for people's statement? People are want to say, if you summon your friend and he doesn't reply, knock down the wall atop him. Apparently that was a, pos- a, uh, a popular saying. Anyone hear anybody say that? You summon? No, okay. Nonetheless, if you summon your friend and he doesn't reply, knock down the wall on top of him. Where does that come from? He says, it's a verse in Yechezkel, in Ezekiel, which says, since I purified you and you were not purified, you will not be purified again. In other words, you get one chance, you don't take it. Now you can have a problem. That's the verse that he, that he quotes. So that passage in the Talmud was applied by Rabbi Paltiel Gaon. And he, he, wrote, he said the following, Where Reuven claims from Shimon, and Shimon refuses to come with him to court, Reuven may bring him to non-Jewish courts to remove his own from Shimon's hand. In other words, to save your property, you are allowed to bring the case in secular courts. So argued Rapaltiel Gaon. Again, we're now talking about going back about 1,200 years. So there's some debate about how to implement this. Does he mean to save your property, you can go to secular court? And it's as simple as that. If I have a case against somebody else and I know that he won't show up in the rabbinic court, then I can just go to secular court? Or do I actually have to go through the ritual of going to the Jewish court, having them try to hear the case, have him refuse to go, and then I get a letter from my rabbi saying, look, you did the best you could, go to secular court. Is there a requirement that you actually try this in Jewish court first? So the answer, of course, is that it's a debate. Take a look at, uh, at source number 19, please. Rabbi Ovadia Yosef. Dealing with a question of a lawsuit, he says, 
representing a defendant, he's talking to a lawyer, and he says, representing a defendant who has been compelled to come to court, meaning secular courts, because the plaintiff refuses to have his case judged under Torah law, forcing the defendant to have his case judged in the secular court, a lawyer may represent him in order to save the victim from those who would harm him. So you're allowed to answer the case in secular courts where you know they're not going to go to a, uh, a Jewish court. He doesn't even seem to require any sort of backup step. You just go to the secular court and the case is heard and you proceed, uh, and you proceed normally. The, um, and that's, that's, one, uh, that's one take. That's when he's acting on behalf of the defendant, correct? That's not a plaintiff case. Well, except to say, except to say that he would, the theoretical obligation would be go to a religious court and get a letter. That would be the, he's not even requiring that. He's saying just answer the case in the, uh, in the secular court and, uh, and you're done. You don't need to go through any rigmarole first. What would happen to the plaintiff? What would you do? I mean, again, the plaintiff would have to, who's bringing the action, would have to, right? Right. So, right. Right. Sign off. Right. I think the reason why I might have thought, and indeed some would argue, that you have to get permission from the Jewish court is in order that you, to have you make the affirmative statement of, I respect Jewish law. This isn't what I want to do. I would have preferred Jewish law. And that way it's very clear that you're not rejecting Jewish law by going there. Even though you're right. It's not like I have other options. At least at first, first my first stop was to say Jewish law would have been my preference and make a statement to that effect. That would have been the, that would have been the reason to, to do so. Yes? I don't know whether this is the time to ask this question, but what happens, and this is a much of Shahaya, what happens when one of the parties uh, takes you to a Croatia court, he loses then, and then he wants to go to a baseball? <laughs> I mean, that's not unusual, unfortunately. <laughs> The, uh, the question was, if, uh, if somebody, the other litigant, took you to secular court, lost, and now decides he wants to go to the, uh, he wants to go to, the, he's done chuba, he's repented, he saw the lights, and he wants to try the rabbinical court, do you have to, um, do you have to go along with that? You know, I'm not sure. I want to think about that one. If I remember, I'll send out, I'll, I'll follow up on this and, uh, and send out a note to the email list. There are actually sources for that. No, no, there's sources for that. It says there. I don't know. I know there are sources, but I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. Okay. Because you have to actually pay all the costs that it incurred in civil court before you go back to the business. You cannot go back to the business until you pay back all the costs of the other business. Okay. That's a nice statement. Okay. I, I still want to look into this. I think it's an interesting question. There was a hand there. Yeah. Could you counterclaim, meaning to say? Well, in which case are you dealing with? You're not dealing with the one that was just asked. You're dealing with it. Okay, so Sarah and David. Okay, so Sarah says to David, I want to take you to a Bay Dick. Then what happened? Oh, okay. Oh, they were about to go safe case. Right. Correct. Would he be allowed to make a counterclaim in that court in order to get his whatever property is involved? I think the answer is yes. I think defending does not only mean you know showing up and uh, and and protecting yourself. I think I think counter once you've started. Uh, a counterclaim on a totally different issue. My suspicion would be that the same would that would well. My suspicion would be no, except if this person in this case knows the other fellow isn't going to respond. And then the question is, do you need the head there or codes? In other words, he may need to get permission from a Jewish court to proceed in the secular court if he wanted to, to do something unrelated, a, uh, an additional claim. That's what it would sound like to me. Yeah, there was a question. Of, you're not uh, bound to uh, just uh, when defendants, it's an independent claim against 
Right. No, I, I, I don't assume on whatever ground you want to come to. Right. I, understood. But I think that, that to do so from a Jewish law perspective would be considered to be a separate aggressive action that may require that you go to a Jewish court first to get the permission that we're talking about. That's what I suspect. You were going to say? Yeah. I, I didn't hear the gentleman with the three elements that started the conversation. But I answer. But in a practical matter, isn't what everybody in the world, that gentleman is saying, what you're saying, if I, I'm a defendant, and I have a Jewish guy who comes to me and gives me a direct uh, statement of claim for a million dollars, and I have 20 days to to reply. Okay, I don't have to first go to a rabbi and say, I want to take him here, and I go through the procedure. I can hire my lawyer friend, and I can defend that, and do whatever I have to do in civil court, because as a practical matter, okay, I am not given the time to do what Jewish law wants me to do. Or there will be a judgment against the Right. So that was that was the case that we were that was what we were talking about back and forth. Was that question? And the answer to it is what Rabbi Ovadia Yosef is saying, it seems, is that there's no need to get a letter. The reason why I might have thought a letter would be needed would be Jim simply for you to make the statement of I am I, I I swear allegiance, so to speak, to Jewish law. But in this case, I'm not able to do anything about it, and therefore I need to proceed. That would have been the logic behind it. But I want to go a little further with this because there's more to there's more to be said here. The um, if you take a look at source number twenty, this puts you in the plaintiff's seat instead of the defendant's seat. He says, I saw in Rabbeinu Asher, and what he's talking about is what we saw in source number 18, the permission to pursue your property in the secular court. He says, from his words, from the words in 18, it appears that even without permission from a Jewish court, one may bring him to non-Jewish courts. Unlike the position of Rav Shri Ragon, Rambam, Mordechai, Baal and he quotes a whole bunch of authorities who disagree and say, no, you need to have specific permission. And he tries to resolve the problem. He says, maybe removing one's property from his hand, meaning from the other party's hand, if it's my property and he has it illegally in my mind, that doesn't require a court's permission. But claiming payment from him would require permission from a court. In other words, there's a difference between where I allege that he actually has my money as opposed to where I, uh, where, where I allege that he owes me money that he should have paid me. Maybe if it's about preserving my assets, I don't even need to get permission from a Jewish court. Whereas, if it's about gaining something from him, then I'm going to need to, uh, to get permission. That's one suggestion that he offers. He's trying to harmonize two different positions. One position saying no permission is needed. One position saying permission is needed. And his answer is, maybe no permission is needed to save property that the other guy grabbed. But if you're talking about getting something new, that's where you require permission. That's his, uh, that's his suggestion. Yes, exactly, along those lines. Alternatively, he says, maybe the position of the rush and the tour, the, permission that, the position that says no permission is needed, maybe they believe one needs permission from the court only when suing a powerful person. Then you need to get permission from the court. Why? What are you talking about? For two reasons. Number one, his refusal, meaning him saying I'm not coming to court, is not called refusal unless he is summoned to court and he doesn't wish to go, which is via court summons. Since his normal conduct is intransigent, he doesn't display serious intransigence until he refuses a summons. So in other words, when you summon a powerful guy and he says, I'm not going, but you didn't actually get the court to issue the summons, that's not called a refusal. That's just what he does before breakfast. You actually have to serve him with papers, and then it's called refusing to, to comply. Alternatively, he says... The, um, lest this action cause a problem. If the court sees potential problems, it certainly will not permit. The other possible concern, he says, and the reason why you would require permission from a Beit Din before going to secular court, would be if there could be fallout. If you're dealing with somebody with whom, if you're going to take him to the secular court, there could be a, uh, a community crisis. That's another story where there are political concerns. Fundamentally, the tendency within a Jewish law 
is to say that the um, that that in the event that you're saving property of yours and going to a Jewish court to get permission would risk that you will not be able to get your property back, like your 20-day answer to the writ type of a case, then you don't need to get permission from a Jewish court, you just go. However, where you have the option of going to the Jewish court and getting the uh, and getting getting permission to go to the secular court that tends to be what we uh, that tends to be what we what we will do in practice what does that look like getting permission from a Jewish court to go to a secular court what exactly does that look like so many authorities in Jewish law actually require that the court the Jewish court the Beit Din hear the case and give permission to the uh, to this person to proceed in the in the secular court. If you take a look at source number twenty three, the Hebrew is on one side, the English is the top of the next side. Where person X has been found liable for a debt or charge, and they cannot produce it from him, they can't get him to pay. And there's a local non-Jewish court which does not accept bribes. They're a fair court. And which accepts Jewish testimony. The elders and students may testify before the judge that X owes Y. It's a mitzvah to do this, he says. Even where the victim is not Jewish and the thief is Jewish, witnesses testify before a judge who is not wicked and he judges the Jew. Where a Jew rebels against judgment... They first warn him publicly, meaning if a Jew says, I don't want to go to a Beit Din, I don't want to go to a, uh, a Jewish court. So you give him a public warning. Should he not accept it? Then they would testify against him and collect from him in non-Jewish courts. Our practice is to announce it three times in the synagogue, a big public announcement, so-and-so won't go to Jewish court. That'll go over well. And then, uh, and then, and then permit this. So what do we require in order for this to happen? The, um, so some require, and this is what I brought you in source 24, that you have to go to an established local rabbinical court in order to, uh, to get permission. Others disagree, and this is what I brought you in source number 25, and say, no, a, uh, a synagogue rabbi is able to give this permission. You don't have to go to the Beit Din. You go to a synagogue rabbi specifically mentioned because this is the person who is appointed to manage issues on behalf of the population. So that will, uh, that will include Include, uh, that will include this. Some require that the rabbinical court or the rabbi evaluate the merits of the claim before issuing the, uh, the permits. They actually have to hear the specifics of what the claim is. Others say no and say it's sufficient for the rabbi to just hear basically what's going on and to say, okay, you can go to the, uh, you can go to the secular court. In practice, um, I've been involved in a couple of cases in which people wanted to know whether they had to proceed to a, uh, to a bait in or where they could hear a case in secular court. For various reasons, they did not want to approach the bait in in question. This is not a, these are not Toronto cases. Please don't assume anything. They, um, but they, they did not want to approach the bait in directly. So they gave me the particulars of the case. I contacted the bait in. And the answer was actually, in the cases that I was involved with, in all of the cases, the answer was they do not need to proceed in the bait in. They can go to secular court and that was that. There was no formal letter written. There was no whatever. It was simply yes, they uh, they're entitled to go to the uh, to the secular court because of the specifics of the uh, the case at hand. But what we have here is is again to answer our case number one. Even though we have this track record of wanting to hear cases in a Jewish court for all of the reasons that we discussed. There is the option of heter er kaot. There is the option of getting permission to go to a secular court. That may not even be needed if one will lose one's own property by waiting to get permission. The, um, where it's a matter of just saving your property. The, uh, otherwise, though, there are different procedures for how one gets this permission. There are various authorities on it. Sources 24, 25, 26 all speak to the different, uh, the different possibilities for what we are going to say. So um, once you get to this point, it is time to actually consult with the, uh, the Beitin to figure out how to, how to proceed. Case number two. Case number two involved Timothy. The defendant is not Jewish. 
I am a Jew, right? Or in the case that I gave you on the sheet, Miriam is a Jew. Miriam alleges fraud on the part of Timothy. Is Miriam obligated to sue Timothy in a Beit Din, in a uh, in a Jewish court? What would you say? No. No. Why not? Because he's not Jewish. So what? You are. Timothy has no obligation. This is true. Why do I care about Timothy's obligation? He's the defendant. I'm the plaintiff. The obligation is only to Jews. Not binding? What do you mean? I mean, the question is whether I have an obligation to try to get him to go to my court first to agree, in, in effect, to be bound by its decision, to view it as religious arbitration. No, but the question fundamentally is, do I have any duty to try to get him to go to a Jewish court? Yeah. So, right, so I, I want to stress... Right. So, I, again, I want to stress what I said at the outset, because I think this is really important. Um, in, in our sources, by and large, there is not a concern for bias in the secular court. They don't seem to be concerned about that problem. That isn't a function of our, pres- of our preference for Jewish courts as a rule. There are particular cases in terms of criminal law where there's a concern for, for punishments being carried out that we would not necessarily approve of. But in terms of the civil court discussions, you really don't see that in the literature. So in the case where the Jew is the plaintiff, and the non-Jew is the defendant. Take a look at Rabbi Shimon ben Semach Duran in source number 27. Top of the last sheet is where the English is found. He says, even when dealing with a non-Jew, one may not litigate in the courts. Can't do it. And he gives you various sources to that effect. And he says, the fact that people go to courts with non-Jews today is to save our property from them. It's a case in which I don't have other options because when I try to summon him to a Jewish court, he laughs at me. The non-Jews do not listen to our judgments and do not pay Jews at the word of a Beitin. Even if it's heard in a Jewish court and the rabbinical court says he has to pay, he's going to walk away and say, I'm not interested. So that's why we go to the secular court in order to save property. So he, but he says a Jewish plaintiff would be obligated to, uh, to do so. However, get to a more complicated case in which there are multiple plaintiffs. Some of the plaintiffs are Jewish. Some of the plaintiffs are not Jewish. These cases were heard already a long time ago. This is not a modern phenomenon. And the ruling was, in that case, you could go to the secular court right away. I gave you a case from the O.L. Yoshua, Rabbi Yoshua Pinchas Bamba, in source number 28. He was dealing with a loan fund in which the members of the loan fund were not Jewish. They were the ones who had invested in the fund. The directors of the fund were Jewish. And there was litigation. They wanted to sue somebody who had, uh, who had not paid back the, uh, the fund. And if you take a look at number 28, Rabbi Bambach said, non-Jews are not commanded to establish Jewish judges. And as long as their court does not accept bribes, they may judge before them. They can go to whatever judge they want. If so, the Jew is not performing a prohibited mission by taking the case to the secular court. As far as the Jew himself, he is not viewed as esteeming the idols by not going to a Jewish court, for this is not his business. He's an agent of the non-Jew. As a result, the Jews may claim their own debt, the money owed to them, under the laws of the nations. For the property has not been divided between the Jewish directors and the non-Jewish shareholders, meaning it's all mixed together. So you're not going to say, well, I'll go to secular court for the, uh, on behalf of the non-Jewish plaintiffs, and then to abate it on behalf of the Jewish plaintiffs. No, it doesn't work that way. He says, that's not the way that it's done. Rather, you can go to the secular court. And in fact, this was a case that uh, someone came to me about. One of the cases for which I approach a Beit Din to ask this question. It was a Jewish fellow who was a partner in a, uh, in a business with non-Jews. The business wanted to sue somebody for defrauding the, uh, the business. And his question was, does he have any obligation? The person who was being sued was Jewish. And the question was, does he have any obligation to try to go to Beit Din first? And the answer was no. They, uh, because there are non-Jewish litigants whose case is entangled with his own, the answer was no obligation. Yeah. Can you make an argument that there are two litigants over here? A Jewish litigant is commanded to set up his courts, a non-Jewish litigant is commanded to set up their courts. 
Right. So they each kind of wash the love of each other's heart. So what are you are what are you suggesting here? Well, I'm saying that's another reason maybe why a Jewish litigant can make a non Jewish litigant to a non Jewish court. Yeah, no, I think so. Jeffrey says since they have a mitzvah of setting up their courts, not of setting up a beit din. I think the Oel Yoshua quote, you know, is is going in that direction. They're they're just doing what they're supposed to do. There's nothing wrong with what they do. He does say that in source number twenty eight. He does continue to say after the part that I translated, it will be great if you could take the Jewish litigant to a rabbinical court to, to a beit din and get it taken care of. But since that's not going to happen, go to Plan B. Yeah. That's an interesting question. The, uh, the question that's asked is, isn't there a concern now that you're providing people with an incentive to find a workaround in case you are worried about having to end up in uh, having to end up in rabbinical court, all you have to do is have a non-Jewish partner in your business Right? You can even sell him a 1% stake. And then any time there's any litigation to be dealt with, you'll be able to go to a secular court. That's the argument? One second. Even beyond that, you just continue to mix affairs with the, uh, all aspects of the business. Because the non-Jews, you can get maybe not doing it for that reason, but over time, the basis becomes relevant. In the case of the Messiah, don't go to the basis anymore. Right. Right. So the argument is that if that's going to be true, if 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 having non-Jewish partners is going to exempt you from having to go to Jewish courts, this will lead to what Rabbi Shlomo Ibn Adara talked about, the atrophy of Jewish courts. It's an interesting point, but I think that the alternative Right? Trying to make a decree that people with non-Jewish partners have to go to a rabbinical court is unworkable. And saying you can't get involved with non-Jewish business partners is, I think, even more unworkable. The, um, I think you're left without options. So you might be right that this will lead to an undesirable result of people not going to bait in because they all are in business with, with partners who aren't Jewish. But I don't see that you have a reasonable alternative. I think it just may be a fact of life. Yes? You go back and I'm sure you kind of going back. The first part of your session that I started with a rule of a rule of the law society rule of economy. Yes. You started the whole discussion about our religion and as Jews what we're obligated to do, but you started with a secular rule that as lawyers that we have to follow and you brought religion into yeah. Yes. I think the more basic part. We took an oath as lawyers. Yep. When we started our careers, that we would obey the laws of our land. Of our land. Yeah. And I hope so. Under those laws, when a client comes to us and says, Do I have the right to go to court as a religious Jew uh, or an observant Jew? Do I have options other than saying to my clients, Yes, you have to go to court under the laws of the province of Ontario? And how do I get out of that right. ethical problem right. that has been created by people taking as a Jew? Uh, that right. So that is what I, when I, in the very beginning, I said I'm dealing with in the, in the December class. In other words, what we're dealing with right now is the opposite. I have a client who is Jewish and observant and wants to satisfy Jewish law, but knows that he needs to end up in secular courts. And how can I help him? What are the options that are available to this client of mine? That's what we're dealing with here. What we're dealing with in December is the question, what if I am an observant Jew, and I've taken this oath, and I have a client who wants to go to a civil court? And my problem is that I don't think that under Jewish law it's justified. Now what do I do? Right? That's, that's the December class. So you're going to have to come back on December 10th. To... Well, I, I promise I will, but I have a question rising again. Yeah. And it happened to me. Okay? I had the privilege of being in the Jewish class, and I was in the Okay, I ordered that the land be deeded and you don't have to sign anything. 
How would you take a legitimate mortgage to the registrar of any of the registry offices in Ontario and put it in front of them and say, you know, you can't do this in your jurisdiction because it's not registered? Right. So this is actually a fascinating topic. I happen to have the good fortune of being in touch with Rabbi Michael Breuer from Atlanta, who is in the Faculty of Law and Religion at Emory University. And this is a specialty of his, how religious courts can conduct their business such that they will be recognized in secular courts. He's done it within Jewish context as well as Muslim context. And he's actually going to be speaking at a seminar this winter at Osgoode on this very topic. It's not a simple and straightforward thing, as you know, or you wouldn't have asked the question. But the answer is that a religious court which takes care to use proper procedures, both proper procedures just in terms of basic things, how you hear testimony, what you count as evidence, how you deal with your litigants, as well as honoring the systems that are in place locally and the laws that are in place locally, depending on the area of law you're talking about, family law is really different from real estate law, their decisions can be respected and held within the secular system. It's going to vary by jurisdiction. It's going to vary by area of law. It's going to vary between the U.S. and different provinces in Canada. But the answer is it absolutely can be done. And I will refer you to that seminar when I have the information on it because it's beyond the scope, the specifics are beyond the scope of what we're talking about now. But please do. I'm going to send it out to the email list. I see hands, and I want to also make sure to get through the rest of the material. So I'm going to take questions that are on this specific point, and we have 15 minutes to go, and then proceed to the last two cases. Yes. And then this is Whitty. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. And the answer is yes, but. Right. Right. The answer to that, though, is yes, but. Because in the event, and this has happened, I don't know enough about Ontario per se. Exactly. Exactly. So it has to be done in a way that the local courts will respect. And then, yes, it can be upheld. No? Okay. So I'm going to go through our last two cases, and then I'll stick around for more questions, but I want to make sure to get through what I promised in the beginning. So we've dealt with the case in which it's two Jews. We've dealt with the case in which the other party is not Jewish. Can you use a non-Jewish arbitrator who is not using a particular legal system? Okay. I'm not talking now about mediation. Mediation is fine. Okay. Going with a non-Jewish mediation or a mediator who is not using Jewish law is 100% okay. This is not an imposed thing. The parties themselves are having it mediated between them. Arbitration is different because in arbitration, there is a set of rules that are being followed. So here we go back to the point that the Chazonish had made before, that Rabbi Avram Yeshaya Karelitz had made, that we discussed earlier. Take a look at source number 29 from the Shulchan Aruch, from the Code of Jewish Law. Rabbi Yosef Karo said, 16th century Israel, if a litigant accepts a non-Jew as judge, even with a formal act of acceptance, what's called in Hebrew a kinyan, the act is nothing, he may not litigate before him. He says, no, accepting the non-Jewish judge doesn't work. Rabbi Moshe Isserlis said, if he already judged before him, you can't recant. Once you accept it, once you hear the case, the case is closed. What exactly is this about? So Rabbi Shabtai Cohen, writing in the 17th century and in source number 30, offers the following resolution. And I'm going to say it outside of the text. He says, it depends on what you're talking about. Are you talking about accepting a set of rules by which to be judged? Or are you talking about accepting an individual in which both parties say, we trust this person to give us a proper ruling? In the event that they accept a set of rules outside of the Torah, that's where Rabbi Karo makes his statement and says it's unacceptable. 
Because that's just another set of rules that aren't the rules of the Torah. That he doesn't want. However, if what you're saying is, yeah, um, whatever, a I mean, Joe non-Jew who's going to be the arbitrator has his set of rules that he uses, but I don't care about his rules. I care about him. I know that he is an honest person, the, uh, and, and he's going to be our arbitrator. We're good with that idea. That's where we say that it's, uh, that it's not problematic, and that's the position taken by Rabbi Avram Yeshaya Karel, it's the Chazanish, in his, uh, in his item which we had earlier in source number, I don't remember. It was, uh, it was source number 14. He says, that's okay. Where you accept the individual, that's good. Last case. This case confused me, and I'm not sure I have the answer, but here's the story. uh, This is a landlord-tenant dispute. And the question that we asked, as I framed it originally, was, Jonathan, an observant Jew, is a tenant of an observant Jewish landlord, Chaya. Jonathan believes that Chaya has failed to fulfill her duties as a landlord, such as by failing to provide adequate heat in the winter. May Jonathan take the case to the Ontario Landlord and Tenant Board. Based on everything we've said, what would you think? Yes, why yes? They're not a mediator. They have their own set of rules. So would this be okay or not okay? So I would have thought not okay. That's what I would have, I would have thought the answer is not okay. And I even looked online in source number 31. There's a website called Din Online where I found someone who addressed a case like this. It was a New York City case about complaining about the landlord. And their answer was that you first go to a base din. You first go to a, uh, a rabbinical court. Having said that, the case came up in this city. The, uh, the party involved who wanted to sue contacted me to ask, do I have to go to a Baytin? I contacted the Toronto Baytin on behalf of this person and asked the question. And their answer was, you don't need to go to us, you go to the Ontario uh, Landlord-Tenant Board. And I couldn't figure out why. I couldn't figure out what was, uh, what was going on. So I, um, so, so I contacted a few people who know this sort of thing better than I do. And the only suggestion that I could get came off of source number 32. And I thank Jeffrey for, uh, for showing me source number 32. From the Residential Tenancies Act. The board has exclusive jurisdiction to determine all applications under this act and with respect to all matters in which jurisdiction is conferred on it by this act. The board has exclusive jurisdiction. So the question is, and I don't know the answer to this, does the phrase exclusive jurisdiction eliminate arbitration? No. Really? Okay, so we have one view here saying that, that it does not exclude arbitration. Yes? Sorry? We have another view that says, no, there's no such thing as arbitration there. This is, uh, would someone just ask? Yeah. Shh. That's a different story, right? But the see the thing is that um, that in in American law, exclusive jurisdiction does not exclude arbitration. You can still you can still arbitrate. I just don't know within Canadian law what the import of the phrase is. He's saying that the that the that the board may send you to arbitration. They will send you to arbitration. Yes. 
That's not even mediation. That's a whole different ballgame. That's a whole different ballgame. Okay, so what I'm going to say is the following. If anybody could find out definitively whether this is exclusive jurisdiction, because I don't know why they were told, why I was told, effectively, that they don't need to go to the basin. They're able to go to the board. And I'm really curious about I have to go back to the basin and find out what the, uh, what the logic in that was. The, um, you couldn't enforce it? I think it's because no. the Okay. Yeah. You're going to say that also. Because the thing about the number of residential tendencies is that it's all free to establish and you can sign the lease that's practically anything that is virtually all irrelevant. Because there are very substantial statutes, protections, and terms. Right. So it's probably a very unique thing. Got it. Okay. I mean, this also comes up. This wouldn't only be a function of the tenancy, um, yeah, the tenancy act. This will be an issue in family law as well, right? In which religious courts have no standing. The uh, religious courts are not able to act at all. So the same justification for going to a secular court for landlord tenant issues would justify going to them for family law issues as well. Saying that, well, arbitration in a religious court is not allowed, so I'm just going to go straight to them. I want to find out more. Again, if you did not sign in in the beginning, particularly if you want credit, but in general, if you did not sign in, please make sure that you sign in. Next program is Sunday morning, December 10th. Thank you very much. So.